Hi, uh, I'm Tom, and I'm games journalist. I realise this sounds a bit like an Alcoholics Anonymous opening, <laughs> but just roll with it. Um, actually, I've been a games journalist for about somewhere between five, six, seven years, depending on how you count it. Uh, <laughs> um, which kind of makes me a bit of a grizzled veteran in this particular world. Um, uh, what I haven't actually done much before is this kind of thing, you know, the, um, the talk, which is why these slides are incredibly basic, because I don't really know how to use PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> you see, back in my day, games journalists didn't really do this kind of high concept talk thing. Instead, we just did endless lists of Skyrim mods. You see, you're laughing, but actually, I unironically enjoy that. I love telling people about the one that makes people put on little hats and celebrate Skyrim Christmas. <laughs> so we'll add that in there. Um, <laughs> but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm actually here to talk about something completely different that I've also been doing for around about five or six years, uh, which is playing and running pen and paper role-playing games. Uh, oh, that's, that was unexpected. Um, <laughs> uh, those two are unrelated, by the way. Um, the, you know, there's no like secret D&D game that you get into and then you can write for Eurogamer. <laughs> Though I've not actually written for Eurogamer, so that might be true. Um, and what I kind of want to talk about is what uh, video games can learn from pen and paper RPGs. This is something I've uh, talked about a couple of times. In fact, I wrote something about it for Alan in 5 out of 10 recently. Um, this, is <laughs> <laughs> this is a different side of the same idea. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the idea of soft control. Now, uh, what's soft control? It's a term I just made up, so I hope you weren't expecting academic citations or anything like that. But basically what it means is um, if you want someone to do something or not do something in a game, you can approach it one of two ways. You can either use hard control, which is just expressly forbidding them. So if uh, I don't want you to shoot anyone, I could just not give you a gun. That'll work. Or I could make something really bad happen when you shoot a gun, like say Alien Isolation does. That's what I like to call soft control. So a really good example of this is the Fallout series. Um, now in Fallout 3, uh, in, both, in all the Fallout games, they don't want you to kill children. That's a thing they want you to avoid for obvious reasons. Um, now in Fallout 3, when you try and do that, all that means is that uh, you, when you point your gun at a kid, you can't pull the trigger. It's physically impossible. That's hard control. In Fallout 1 and 2, you can kill children if you want, but Chris Avalon will hunt you down and murder you. That's not a joke. Um, you get an, a, a reputation called Child Killer up there. Um, and what that means is that everyone hates you, and occasionally bounty hunters come and try and kill you, and one of them is called Chris Avalon, which I guess is an Easter egg. <laughs> Speaking of Joe's talk, I also have a picture of Deus Ex. I, th I think this is perhaps a, more, um, a, a better representation of your actual experience playing Deus Ex than the ones Joe put up. Because, let's face it, this is the game about crawling around in vents. Um, why is that? Um, I mean, Deus Ex is famously supposed to be the game that you can either go stealthy or you can run in and shoot everyone. Um, and physically, you can do both of those things. But you probably won't. You'll probably be an event. I mean, who's actually played Deus Ex where you just run in and shoot everyone? That's more than I expected, and it's still like four. <laughs> no, no, you won't get very far, especially in the first game, more so in Human Revolution, because in the first game it's very hard to shoot people because the shooting system isn't very good. But also because they put little goodies in the air vents. There's like experience points, and there's cool things to find, and little bits of story and hidden rooms, and almost all of it is accessible through air vents. So that's a good example of soft control. A bad example is Dragon Age. I was gonna actually going to have a picture of the Dragon Age uh, Inquisition experience thing in there, but I couldn't really find anything that represented it, so you just got this generic art, I'm afraid. Um, now, I really love Dragon Age, in fact. Um, again, when I recently wrote some articles for Alan, I, uh, I love Bioware games so much that I wrote about two different things, and in both things, the example of how to do it right was Mass Effect, uh, because, you know, it's the best game trilogy around, and if you disagree, you can find me RL. But <laughs> but the, uh, the experience system in Dragon Age Inquisition is really weird, because they give you experience for everything. You plant a flag on a hill, you get some experience. You uh, read a code of sanctuary, you get some experience. You craft something, you get some experience. And which of these things am I actually supposed to be doing, Bioware? Which one is the goal? If you're just going to give me experience for everything I do, you might as well level me up every half hour. <laughs> It'll have the same effect. Um, now... <laughs> So um, this is where we bring come up to pen and paper RPGs. But because in pen and paper RPGs, you can theoretically kind of do everything at any time, as long as the dungeon master is okay with it. 
That means they always have to use soft control. There is no such thing really as hard control. So, uh, hands up, who has actually played a pen and paper role playing game? That's quite a lot of people. Okay, now keep your hand up if you've played a pen and paper role playing game that is not Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, my joke was based on the fact that most of you would put your hands down at this point. <laughs> but obviously, I guess we kind of self-selected by advertising this talk in advance. Um, so I'm just going to pretend that, you, uh, that hardly any of you put your hands up. Uh, <laughs> my uh, joke here was going to be that, you know, if this was video games and I'd said Call of Duty, that would be pretty bad. Um, and in fact, when it comes to video game inspirations and pen and paper role playing games, that's kind of the same thing. You know, if you've played any of these games, this is their counterpart. Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale are Dungeons and Dragons 2nd edition. Uh, Neverwinter Nights is Dungeons and Dragons 3rd edition. Neverwinter Nights 2 is uh, 3.5 edition. And the Knights of the Old Republic games are Star Wars D20, which is basically um, 3.5 edition with, uh, but Star Warsified. Yes, there is an edition called 3.5. Please do not ask me to explain how D&D editions work because Wikipedia has a color-coded diagram. <laughs> and this is just a third of it. This is the bit that fit on screen. It stops at 1995. We're actually on fifth edition now, so even with the super mainstream things, we're like two editions behind. Um, <laughs> which, is <laughs> which is ridiculous, really, when you think about it. I mean, the idea of video game developers just riffing on something from the 90s over and over again. I mean, whoever really thought of that? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jake, I don't know how that got in there. <laughs> um, but, uh, and this is the part where we start getting into big generalizations because I don't have that much time, so sorry about that. Around the 2000s, uh, well, actually, let's start off with the first edition of d the very first. This is what it looks like. Well, it's not actually what it looks like. This is kind of a HD remaster, re-release thing. But man, that is an awesome looking box, so I put it on the screen. Um, now, way, way back, this was in the early 70s. This was so long ago that the fighter was called the Fighting Man. <laughs> so long ago that there was a wandering harlot table, just to... <laughs> just in case you wanted to know whether you encountered a slovenly troll or a brazen strumpet. <laughs> but back at this point, there was an optional rule. Um, not like the wandering harlot table, but it's mandatory. Uh, but uh, that might not actually be true, but it's a really funny joke. Um, where, which stated that for every one gold earned, the player should earn one experience point. And this replaced the idea of getting experience points for killing monsters. Now this was really interesting, because it changed the way the game was approached entirely. Because if you get experience with killing monsters, that's all you're going to do. But um, if you do it for this way, well, for a start, this is what starts the whole idea of the RPG as the hyper-capitalist adventure. This is why Diablo exists, in my opinion, anyway. <laughs> um, so let's, let me uh, give you a hypothetical question. Let's say you encounter an owlbear <laughs> guarding a chest. This is an owlbear. D&D monsters are amazing. You can't actually read that text probably from where you are, but this is from the Pathfinder Vestigiary, and the official explanation for the existence of the owlbear is, I don't know, maybe a wizard did it. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it. So, um, in fact, that's the explanation for most monsters in D&D. &D. Um, so let's say you're counting one of these, guarding a chest full of gold. If you're gonna get experience for killing monsters, you're just gonna stab them and take the gold. That's what you're gonna do. But if you get experience for getting the gold, you could do a lot of different things. You probably don't want to fight him because you might get hurt. You could try and sneak past him. You could try and trick it. You could negotiate. And so this leads to a weird thing where that's how people mostly played D&D, &D, you know, full of tricks and rules exploits and using spells in creative ways. And that's really cool, but that's not what Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson were thinking when they made the game. They wanted it to be Lord of the Rings and Conan what they got was the adventures of Loki if all he wanted were bigger swords. So around the 2000s, again, this is where I start generalizing a bit, people start thinking more about how do we emulate specific kinds of fiction in games? Um, and a guy who's really into this is uh, Robin D. Laws. He's written a book called Hamlet's Hit Points where he tries to reverse engineer the plot of Hamlet into a game by examining the themes and dramatic beats of Hamlet. It's really interesting. Even if you're, uh, even if you're just into regular games, it's worth a read. Um, but... Um, Here's uh, something from one of his other games, which is called Feng Shui. Again, this is where I would joke about someone in the audience because I played this with Christos at Game City, but he's not here. Um, so in Feng Shui, it's uh, basically kind of a pastiche of 90s Hong Kong action movies, you know, Jackie Chan, John Woo, that sort of stuff. And this is one of the rules, one of my favorite rules ever. 
Pop action shotgun, 13 damage. If you spend some time to sh cock your shotgun dramatically, it does more damage. <laughs> it's fantastic, I love this. Because I don't know much about guns, but I'm pretty sure this isn't how they work in real life. <laughs> but it's totally how they work in John Woo movies. That's absolutely how it works. And so what Robin Laws has done is he's taken the implicit rules of that universe and he's reverse engineered them into a game to encourage you to go in a really dramatic fashion, to, to make you act like you're in a John Woo film. That's why I really like this. But um, I'm gonna, now I'm going to talk about a game called Dungeon World. Um, I just, it's just really useful for illustrating my point. <laughs> it's, um, this is based on a uh, game engine called Apocalypse World, because you can also have engines in RPGs, they're kind of dice engines, that's how it works. Um, and uh, there's a lot of games based on Apocalypse World. This isn't my favorite game, it's not even my favorite Apocalypse World derived game, but it's really useful for making this point, which is why I'm doing it. Um, now in Apocalypse World based games, you get these things called moves, um, which basically explain what you do. This one is for the fighter, it says Ben Bars Death Gates. Um, now, you can pretty much do this in any game. You know, if you wanted to kick down a door, you could say, um, I'm gonna kick down this door. And the DM might say, yeah, sure, make a strength check or whatever. But because this is right there on your character sheet, as soon as you hand this to someone, they're gonna start smashing down every door in sight. Because when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. There's a few interesting things about Dungeon World. One of them is that uh, its experience system is very simple, very short. You take, it takes five experience points to level up. Not, you know, 11,000 and everything does like 100 experience, 200 XP, how much is very much five. And level, uh, leveling up is a big deal as well. It's not like plus 2% damage or anything like that. If you level up once as a fighter, your sword can become intelligent and start talking to you. So it's a big deal. Um, now, how does it award those experience? For a few different things. One of them is right here. If you fail a roll, you mess it up, you get experience. Now, that's actually quite interesting. The, the thematic thing is that you learn from your mistake. But the practical application of that is that you try things you're not very good at. You try, you gamble, because what's the worst that can happen? You get more experience. Um, so that kind of stops you from doing this thing where only the guy who knows is good at talking does all the talking or whatever. Uh, you also get XP for obeying your alignment. That's an example of this up here. Um, I'm actually a fan of the traditional Dungeons and Dragons alignment, like lawful good, chaotic evil, all that stuff. Um, but anyway, you choose one at uh, character creation and that will give you a goal to work towards. Hopefully you can read that. Um, the reason I said I'm not a fan is because this, uh, the bottom one there is from an, a setting for Dungeon World called Inverse World, which turns it into kind of a Final Fantasy Skies of Arcadia style floating islands and airships game. And in that one, they've interestingly replaced the idea of alignment with a slightly more relativ relativist morality where you've got a drive and a specific goal. Um, I think that's more interesting. They also replaced the idea of the fantasy race, which I wish, really wish we'd say species instead, with um, backgrounds, which is also cool. Um, and you also get experience for bonds. Now this is really interesting. This is a bond. This is what it looks like. You just get these sentences with little gaps in um, that you fill in with one of the other players. So I might say at the start, um, Jake is soft, but I will make him hard like me. <laughs> Again, I didn't make that up. That's actually in the game, innuendo and all. I haven't actually made anything up. I haven't actually made a joke about a game since 2008. I just say things that are really in there and then people laugh. <laughs> but if I've been adventuring for Jake for, with Jake for a while and I respect him a bit more, I might, I might cross that out and replace it with, I respect Jake's capabilities as a warrior. And then I gain one experience for developing my relationship with him. That's really interesting. I mean, imagine if like Dragon Age did that because that's what the game's really about, right? It's a fancy dating simulator. Um, you could also do something a bit less generic than the things I just said. But again, I'm just being simple to save time. Um, so you can do that. And the last one is just for obeying the session goals. That one's not very important. This is just kind of a list of the themes of the games. And you engage with any one of those as a group, you get an extra experience point. So what does Dungeon World reward you for? It rewards you for trying risky things, for role playing your character's motivations, for developing relationships with the characters, and for sticking to the themes of the game. And if you do all of those, you're basically a hair away from having a talking sword in one session. Um, and that's what I really like about this, is that there's a clear list of the things they want you to do in a game, and then they reward you specifically for those and not for anything else. Um, another good example of this recently, Pillars of Eternity, only gives you experience for completing quests, not for killing monsters. So if you want to sneak your way past or trick your way past, that's fine. Um, so what does all this mean? Because I'm now in charge of games, and I'm going to tell you how or how to make them. Um, 
the things I think people should do, the things that video games can learn from pen and paper RPGs, make experience points meaningful, and this usually means having less of them to level up, make each one count. Um, reward players for engaging with the themes of your game, identify what they are, and then you know work backwards from there. And reward non-traditional actions, not just killing things. I mean, you can reward killing things if you want, if that's what your game is about, and that's perfectly fine. I'm quite, I'm okay with killing things. Please don't tweet that out of context. Um, but if that's not what your game's about, don't, don't reward people for it. And finally, and this is a big one for me, emulate fiction, not reality. Um, I hate it when people say, oh, we put this in the game because it's realistic. And that's just like, well, you just failed to do any game design there, didn't you? I think instead you should look at the, what you're trying to evoke, the themes and maybe the genre of fiction, if you're going genre woods, and work backwards from there, as with this whole example, which again, I love. So more of this, less of this, well, actually, less of the experience system in this game that is not communicated by this picture at all. <laughs> so that's about it for me. But uh, finally, I just wanted to put up some good beginner games for people who don't know much about pen and paper RPGs, which it turns out is not very many people um, up here. So uh, there's quite a few Apocalypse War games because I think they're great introductions. Uh, the ones I talked about here, and also Monster Hearts, which is a, a queer RPG about um, monsters in high school falling in love and being a mess of hormones. <laughs> For some reason, I thought this might play well with this crowd. Uh, other games, uh, Feng Shui. Star Wars Edge of the Empire has a really cool custom dice system, and it's a Star Wars game, so people mostly know the setting. Marvel Heroic World Playing is really good for sort of teaching you to play as a character, because telling you play as Spider-Man is a lot simpler than constructing your own character from whole cloth. Um, and uh, finally, Mouse Guard, which is, again, really interesting, really gorgeous art, and I believe I played that with uh, Dr. King over there uh, at Game City. If you're out in the next Game City, I'll probably be doing this again. So that's it. I'm going to leave those up on there while people ask me questions. If you want to know any more about beginner games, you can always ask me questions. I was going to say you can find me at the bar, but this is the last talk, so you might not have that much time. Uh, but yes. Thank you.